A Lost Legion Fan Lore Chapter 1 The Ascending Sun The history behind the Primarch of the 11th Legion of Adeptes Astartes has been lost to the Imperium of Man after the Emperor enacted the Edict of Obliteration. It was declared that all likelihood, symbols, and records of this Legion be erased to the point where it would seem like they never existed. The following is a collection of reports from various sources throughout the galaxy spanning untold centuries. Most, if not all of these sources, have disappeared soon after they have gone public. The 11th Legion's Primarch, just like his brothers, was stolen from the Emperor and flung across the galaxy, all thanks to the ruinous powers of chaos. As his gestation pod soared through space, a tiny chunk of debris cracked his pod. This was all thanks to the Lord of Change, for the corruption of chaos now began to taint the young Primarch. However, it was very minutely, but Zeech's plans had already been set into motion. The Primarch's pod landed upon the technologically advanced planet known as Kyosha Vor. The Primarch was quickly found and taken to the leaders of this world, the Council of Three. These three wise men saw this as a sign of the prophecy of the stars, a prophecy that spoke of the coming of a new king who would bring rise to a new evolutionary line to the people of Kyosha Vor. The Council of Three raised him as one of their own. He was educated and trained extensively. There was no task that the young Primarch would not accomplish, and he soon became a master scholar and a very adept warrior. At the time of his maturity, he finally gave himself a name. The young Primarch chose a name that was the very same name as that of the ancient king of Kyosha Vor, the man who would unite the world under his own rule, Alec Elric. Elric then began to travel across the planet alongside the Council of Three. Together, they made their way across the five great continents, constructing massive pylons of star energy, or so he was told. During this time, Elric began getting visions of death and destruction, as well as demonic images. These nightmarish visions were actually Zeech's way of torturing the young Primarch, assaulting his mental fortitude bit by bit slowly cracking away at Elric's sanity. The visions were strong, yet few and far between, and so Elric tended to ignore them. During the construction of the final pylon, Elric came across a glimmering shard that strangely enough could cut straight through the planet's toughest metals. Taking advantage of this strange crystal's capabilities, Elric fashioned himself a powerful spear and he used the shard as the tip of this weapon. Once again, Zeech was to blame for this little twist of fate, as this was actually a Catan shard. Many moons pass, and now it is the day before Elric would be crowned king. Using his vast intellect, he creates a suit of armor fit for a king, yet still battle-worthy. The Council of Three are now about to officially crown Elric as the king. However, the planet shakes and goes completely dark. The world trembles as flashes of emerald light emanate from the pylons. A massive surge of energy pulses from the pylons deep into Kyosha Vor's crust, and moments later, the ground tears itself apart. From within these deep fissures, an army of skeletal warriors begins to crawl out. Alec Elric looks to his mentors, the Council of Three, for answers. However, what he sees shakes him to his core. Elric is frozen at the sight of these three men morphing into one another, as their flesh twists and turns into a mixture of scales and feathers. The newly formed avian demon rips a portal into space, but just as the demon is about to enter this tear in reality, 
Elric's spear pierces straight through the demon's shoulder. My boy, you dare strike your beloved mentors? The demon speaks out, and as it opens its beaked mouth, within its maw, the council of three's faces speak out as they morph between one another. You did this. This is all your fault, Eric shouts out. No, this was not of my doing. We are all but pawns in his game. And with that, a slew of multicolored demons spew out from the portal, knocking down Elric towards the newly awoken Necrons below. As thousands upon thousands of Necron warriors wreak havoc across the world, warp tears have also been summoning out Zechian demons, thus creating a worldwide extinction event for the people of Kyosha Vor. Alec Elric fights his way back towards the Demonic Council of Three, as passages from the Prophecy of the Stars run through his mind. In a shower of color and flame, new life will rise again. How could I not see this coming? Elric asks himself. I've spent my entire life with the Council of Three. All I've known has been built upon lies and manipulation. And those that are paying for it are the people of Kyosha Vor. Covered in the immaterial juices of demons and the ichor-like lifeblood of the Necrons, Elric reaches the podium where the avian demon now stands. The two warriors lock eyes, and a great battle begins. Pushing his body to its limits, the unarmed Primarch takes the upper hand, as each blow struck slows down the demon, yet he is unable to retrieve the spear that is still embedded within the shoulder of the beast. As the battle rages on, searing bolts of green strike at Elric, vaporizing portions of his armor. The Necrons had made their way past Zeech's minions, and had now began firing at the greater demon and the Primarch. This momentary pause in the demon's attack gave Elric the opening that he needed, and with all his might he ripped out the spear. With that same motion, he plunged the spear once again straight through the demon's face, slicing straight down, leaving the demon clean in two. As the creature of the warp slowly dematerialized, with a grim cackle, multicolored flame engulfed Elric. Through the pain of the warp fire, Elric heard the demon's final words. A shower of color and flame. Your new life begins anew. With the warp flame still enveloping him, Elric continues to fight on, slaying countless Necrons. Each skeletal warrior slain would be one less threat to his people, he thought to himself. As he attacked the Necrons, the people of Kyosha Vor saw him, and instantly they knew that he was indeed the child of prophecy, the Comet Warrior. For his speed and warp flame made it seem like a falling star darting across the battlefield, leaving death and destruction in its wake. To Elric's surprise, the warp flame would not extinguish. The pain was definitely there, but there was no visible damage being done to him. For what seemed like an eternity to Elric, he continued to fight on. His body battered, bruised, torn, but his psyche was even worse off. He thought to himself that perhaps he was the one truly responsible for this atrocity. And all at once it hit him, the severity of it all, the betrayal of his mentors, the destruction of his world, and once again the visions came back to haunt him. Who am I? Who can I trust? What can I do? Elric collapsed down to one knee, and as he tried to lift himself with his spear, a mob of Necrons approached, ready to end the Primarch's life. His armor broken, his body now at its limit, and with no hope left, Alec Elric accepted death. Just then, a golden light descended from the heavens. The Emperor was here for his son. 
The Emperor of Mankind teleported between Elric and the Necrons, and with a single swing of his flaming sword, the Necrons were no more. As the Emperor turned to aid his son, the Warp Flames also extinguished, and the two teleported back to the Emperor's flagship. With no hope left for Kyosha Vor, the Imperial fleet enacted Exterminatus. Elric and the Emperor spoke alone for quite some time. And because of this, to repay the Emperor for saving his life, Alec Elric would devote all his efforts towards bringing the Emperor's dream into reality, the unification of humanity. When the conversation was over, Elric emerged as the Primarch of the 11th Legion of Adeptus Astartes, the Celestial Sons. Celestial Sun Lore, Chapter 1.5 Prelude to Hellfrost and Heaven's Flame They came at us in droves, hundreds of greenskins, rushing to be the very one whom would bash our heads in first. Their stench, actions, and existence were all so ugly and brutal. Little did they know they were running to their demise. There were five of us on the Seer Council, and each would massacre approximately hundreds before falling. The Wa of the Iron Fist arrived via rocks, but our Eldritch Lightning crumbled their makeshift transports before they could approach us. We needed to buy time for our avatar to awaken. Our Exarch had been receiving visions, foretelling fire and wars, and the answers he sought would only come to him by summoning the bloody-handed god, Cain. And so we fought, non-stop battle, for a grueling hour. Wraith-bone blades deliciously bathed in orc blood, while our shuriken pistols jammed at the copious amounts of viscera they possessed. The battle was a gory one, yet not a single orc chose to penetrate the defensive line of the Aldari during the first hour. This is when the war boss arose. With a guttural wah, his generals descended, riding upon massive squigoths. Our warp abilities did little to stop their charge, and before we knew it, they were already upon us. Farseer Ashidra was the first to fall. The massive beast trampled her, and with her death, our force field was weakened. The rain of green-skinned fire finally cracked the dome, and another one of ours was taken. Her screams drowned by the echoing laughter of the orcs as they ripped through her flesh. Farseer Onres was locked in a battle as green clashed against white. Before I could act, the war boss drove his mechanized fist directly through Onris's back. Alien and I retreated towards our exarch, where he was performing the ritual. It was in that moment when I gazed upon a most glorious sight. The mighty Kaela Minshaw Cain had been summoned. With a single slash of his flaming sword, the orcs disintegrated into ash. From the ash, the squigarts charred forth, impaling the avatar. As they began to melt from intense heat, a thunderous bolt of wa energy came crashing down. Once the smoke cleared, the next sight caused my heart to stop completely. There stood Warboss Iron Fist, clutching the severed head of the avatar of Cain in his bony fingers. This was the last thing I would see. The death of a god and the rise of Warboss Deadfist. Celestial Sun Lore Chapter 2 Hellfrost and Heaven's Flame Rushing headlong into battle, the Imperium sends both the Space Wolves and the Celestial Suns into action. Receiving orders directly from the Emperor, the Space Marines are sent to liberate the enslaved human populace from the rule of Wa Deadfist. The plan of attack was a simple one. 
Lehman Russ and his wolves would focus on drawing the attention of the orcs, while Elric and his Astartes would rescue the humans. They struck in the dead of night. The thunderous roar of the storm eagles and the earth-shaking arrival of drop pods massacred hundreds of thousands of unsuspecting orcs. Lehman Russ, accompanied by Bjorn the Fell-Handed, took out a bloody trail of orcs as they made their way towards the war boss. The ground trembled as a stampede of squigoths charged directly at Russ. With a few well-placed shots from his bolter, Bjorn kills the massive beasts. From behind the bodies of the slain war beasts, Deadfist and his bodyguard challenge the two space wolves. The Fell-Handed takes on all four of the knobs, knowing full well to leave the war boss to Russ, and he would gladly put his life on the line so that no orc would interrupt his Primarch's duel. Lehman Russ takes out his mighty axe and charges at Deadfist, while Deadfist also readies his attack. The savage orc brings down his warhammer, but Russ's axe deflects the blow, while also taking out a chunk of the Xenos' throat. Xenos' blood is finally spilled on the battlefield, and Russ lands another devastating swipe across the Xenos' face. Deadfist's lower jaw has completely been severed off. Blood and drool ooze from the wound, and Deadfist is brought to his knees. The Wolf King's axe gets ready to cleave straight through his head, and with a thud, the orc is slain. Angered at such an easy victory, Russ turns his back at the orc. But this battle is long from being over. The Aldari bones adorning this orc begin to brightly glow, and with a mighty wah, Deadfist rises. Lehman Russ smirks as he yells, Now that's more like it! Give me a good fight, beast! The battle rages on, and with each death of the orc, it continuously gets revived via these skeletal remains of the Eldari. Swirling energies of green eldritch stitch the orc together. Each time, he emerges bigger, stronger, and tougher. But the worst part of it all is the hundreds upon thousands of orc spores released with each death. Russ knows that this is quite fun, but he has to end it, and soon. Warboss Dedifist, now hulking over the wolf lord, comes in for an attack, and in a swift motion, the orc falls. Russ's bloody axe lands upon the bloodstained ground, with Deadfist's brain splattering across the blade. The Wolf King thinks to himself that surely no living being can survive without a brain. But to his surprise, the orc's massive skeletal hands move, and they pin him straight to the ground. Deadfist roars as he lifts a massive boulder above his head, ready to crush his enemy to a pulp. Bjorn attempts to rush to his Primarch's aid, but the war boss's knob bodyguards hold him at bay, for they too have the Aldari bones dawned upon them. Just as the massive greenskin was about to crash the boulder upon Lehman Russ's skull, a searing blast of white hot flame envelops the orc. The intense heat of the warp fire incinerated the Aldari bones reducing them to mere ash, and their regenerative powers barely kept Deadfist alive. Suffering horrendous burns, the orc's eyes had melted away. His tough orc hide singed to the bone in most places. From behind Lehman Russ stood another Primarch, clad in white light. Alec Elric had arrived. Foul Xenos, die for your crimes against humanity. And with a mighty stomp, Elric killed Deadfist. For good this time. Lehman Russ angrily rose to his feet and approaches Elric. 
He spat in the direction of him. That was my prey, my kill. Have you no honor? You show me no respect. And worse yet, you rely on magic rather than on your own skill in combat. Elric ignores his brother Primark and turns his attention to the knobs. Once again, Elric's eyes burn white and he unleashes yet another pillar of white hot warp flame upon the orcs. This time, the orcs and the bones are reduced to ash. Elric continues to ignore the space wolves and he continues his fiery onslaught upon the horde of Xenos. Russ looks out across the war-torn battlefield and sees the celestial suns pushing back the orcs. Angrily, he orders Bjorn to pull back his legion, and with a snarl, the Wolf King leaves the planet. In a tide of fire and flames, the orc wall has been brought to its knees. With no war boss, the orcs began to fight amongst themselves, and in a matter of days, the orc war machine has been eradicated to the point of only a handful of orcs hiding amongst the swamps of this world. At this point, only a single assault squad was ordered to stay behind and hunt these beasts. The squad was led by Captain Scorn, a celestial son regarded as an expert in close quarters spear combat. Deeper and deeper, the five-man squad went into the swamplands, massacring orcs wherever they were found. Unfortunately, things became a little strange. To their surprise, the local flora and fauna of this area was becoming encased in ice. A trail of frozen dead led them to a small cavern. With weapons drawn, they entered. Upon the walls of this cavern, blood and frost can be seen. Just then, a hail of fire rains upon the space marines. Captain Scorn realizes that these are no mere bullets, but actually bolter rounds, most likely stolen from the previous battle. Hanging from the stalactites above, a few orcs donned looted armor as well as looted weapons from the Space Wolves and Celestial Sun Legions. Unfortunately, during this onslaught of ultra rounds, a Marine falls under the hail of fire. But the immediate threat has been taken out. Captain Scorn and the Space Marines have slayed them. Scorn says a few words for his fallen battle brother, and they continue onwards. Deeper and deeper they go. A few moments later, they encounter a knob in full armor. The orc roars as he fire off a stream of health rust from two looted pistols. This icy stream freezes two marines in their place, but Scorn's spear has penetrated through the orc's stolen armor. Scorn called out to the last marine, Varos, let's get these marines back to the HQ. They need an apothecary ASAP. Just then, Varos notices a blinking red light just under the fallen orc's body. Captain, run! He calls out, but he's too late. The melta charge goes off in an explosion of plasma and hellfrost. And when Varos comes to, he was the only survivor. He could hear the roar of more orcs coming towards the sound of the blast. With no other choice, Varos picks up his captain's famed weapon, and he awaits the horde. At the Celestial Sun HQ, Apothecary Rolas attempts to Vox communicate with the Assault Squad Scorn, but no response. Just as the sun was rising, the Apothecary could see a lone figure walking his way. Armor glistening amongst the dawn's light, it is Varos. He has survived. Upon arrival to the main fleet of the Celestial Sons' Legion, the Primarch Alec Elric 
has named Varos captain of a new assault squad, and thus he has been given the title as Varos of the Dawn's Lands. Celestial Sun Lore Chapter 3 Deceit and Decay For quite some time, the 11th Legion had been liberating planets and bringing them into Imperial compliance. Alec Elric, their Primarch, had grown rather fond of his top three commanders. These Marines were Sol Oros, Vicus Rowan, and Dante Hueco. These warriors gave their Primarch countless victories during their battles. However, this next mission would be unlike any other. Elric received a distress signal from the Forge World of Aldia. The signal had been emitting for months prior, yet the Celestial Suns continued in their investigation. Sol Oros had been leading a massive force upon the forge, while Dante Hueco and Varos investigated the moons above. After landing upon the moons, the two marines felt uneasy. After their search, they stumbled across a massive fissure. The ground then began to quake, as three burrowing demons emerged from beneath the surface. The grotesque foul creatures lunged at the Battle Brothers, but Hueco launched warp lightning, emitting from his fingertips directly onto the beasts. This caused them to explode, expelling steaming hot globs of goo all across the lunar landscape. Dante looked to Varos, and the two space marines knew that something was indeed amiss, so they decided to descend down into the fissure from whence the creatures came. The deeper they dove, the air began to reek pungently, until they finally reached an opening, and to their surprise, they discovered a massive horde of decomposing humanoids. Amongst these creatures stood a massive, foul, bloated beast in the center. Varos readied his melt -a bomb as Hueco called in for a Terminator teleport strike on their position. Just as the Melta charge detonated, a five-man Terminator squad arrived. The Celestial Suns fired numerous bolter rounds into the Horde. Even though the demons' bodies were being torn apart by each blast, the creatures continued their advancing attack. The Terminators readied their power fist and charged in at this insidious Horde. The slow, lumbering beasts were no match against the armored might of the Terminators. Finally, the entrails and festering sludge from their fallen enemies stuck to their armor like glue. But soon, this visceral glue began to melt their armor. Before Dante Hueco could give another order, large tentacles burst in through the ground, entangling two of the Terminators. Their attempts to break free proved fatal, as their lifeless bodies were now being dragged towards the maw of the massive creature. When his mouth opened up, swarms of flies encapsulated the broken armor of the Terminators, entering inside their bodies. Moments later, their corpses reanimated, and friend turned to foe as the Terminators began to assault their once battle brothers. By this time, the Midnight Sun, Dante Hueco, was now completely weaponless. The vast amount of demonic viscera had now melted his dual plasma pistols to virtually nothing. Varos, the Dawn's Lance, was also on the defensive, and another Terminator had also fallen to the Horde. With no choice left, Hueco called for a retreat. But once again, the demon's tentacles sprang to attack impaling a loyal Terminator. Hueco fired volley after volley of lightning, but the demon used the body of the dead Terminator as a shield. Varos then threw his lance, piercing the great demon, but it seemed like no damage was done, for the demon didn't even take notice. Thankfully, Varos had tricked the demon by attaching his grenade belt to the lance, the ensuing explosion sent both the marines and demons flying in the air. 
when Huego and Varos came to their senses, they saw the remaining Terminators holding off the demons. They came to the aid of their battle brothers. However, by this time, death was imminent. The horde was too vast, and the demon still looked like no damage had been dealt to it. They knew that this would be their last attack, and so they drew their combat knives and began to finish off what demons they could. The thunderous blows from the power fists of the Terminators seemed to do damage to the lesser demons, until a massive cleaver made a swift blow, beheading the remaining Terminators. The greater demon cackled as he claimed more lives for Grandfather Nurgle. Hueco then gave the order to Varos, telling him to leave and to get word back to their Primarch. Varos sets on his journey knowing that this sacrifice would be forever honored throughout the lineage of the Celestial Sons. But then, Varos notices that a tentacle has been hanging on to his foot. The tentacle then applies pressure, cracking his armor and pulling him down to the floor. He knows now that he will soon be turned into the undead, but he will not let this happen. He must not. He has to get word out to his superiors. Four more tentacles spring up and entice the Celestial Sun. Death is imminent, but just then, the demon bursts into flames. The fires dance around, lighting up every other demon and changing colors until the horde is completely extinguished in this mysterious flame. The fires then culminate to one massive pyre, and then they dance their way to the celestial suns, engulfing them, yet not harming them. Visions appear before both Varos and Hueco, visions depicting great powers bestowed upon them, should they decide to pledge themselves to the ruinous forces of chaos. These visions also reveal the true nature of their emperor, and when the flames died out, so too did their allegiance to the Imperium. Varos of the Dawn's Lance and Dante Hueco, the Midnight Sun, have now descended into chaos, all thanks to a little bit of help from Zeech, the God of Mischief. <laughs> Celestial Sun Lore, Chapter 4 The Forge World of Aldia Alec Elric, the Primarch of the Celestial Suns, had lived a life full of lies and suffering due to the machinations of the Chaos God of Change, Zeech. Since the time of Elric's gestation pod cracking, Zeech had left his touch upon the Primarch, causing illusions and nightmares to plague him, with each vision plunging his psyche deeper and deeper into the depths of darkness. It was Zeech's schemes that placed Elric upon the planet of Kyoshavor, which was already under his rule via the Council of Three. The events that transpired upon Kyoshavor literally broke Elric both mentally and physically. Despair swallowed the Primarch at seeing his homeworld and people die before him. At the reveal of the Council of Three being a demonic follower of Zeech, his mental fortitude shattered. All he ever knew was a lie. He was used as a pawn, and all his accomplishments were orchestrated by Zeech. To try and cope with this overwhelming realization of his uselessness and loss of free will, Alec Elric materialized a second personality, a more ruthless and sadistic side. 
Even though the Emperor of Mankind knew of Zeech's puppet strings upon Elric, he still allowed his son to lead the 11th Legion as their Primarch. Elric fully pledged himself towards accomplishing the Emperor's goal, the unification of mankind. This would be the foundation for Elric to stand upon and rebuild himself. Meanwhile, deep within the dark corridors of the Crystal Labyrinth, the Architect of Fate laughed as he thought to himself that everything is going all according to plan. Throughout the Great Crusade's early years, the Emperor couldn't ignore the duality of Elric. Due to his traumatic experiences at witnessing his people's demise, Elric and the Celestial Sons liberated hundreds of human civilizations from the rule of Xenos, and as such, he was called the Hope of Humanity and the Light of the Imperium. While in reality, he was still recovering from his despair, and he was hiding the darkness of his dual personalities. Most of the time, Elric was a calm, collected, and stoic tactician, but when his other persona took over, he would become a crazed man, and he would lash out in fits of burning rage. To counter these outbursts, the Angelus Solaris were created as the honor guard to their Primarch. Indeed, the Celestial Suns casted a bright light of hope. But in this grim, dark galaxy, even the brightest light will cast a dark shadow. With the aid of the Grandfather of Pestilence, Nurgle, Zeech set his plan forward in order to convert the Celestial Suns into serving him fully. Nurgle invaded both the Moon and Forge World of Eldia, and within just a few weeks, the entire populace of Eldia was either dead or corrupted by the plagues of Nurgle. The 11th Legion responded to the distress signals sent out by the Forge, and it split its forces during their investigation. The main force landed upon the planet in various locations of interest, while Dante Hueco and Varos of the Dawn's Lance investigated the moon. The events that transpired upon the moon can be seen in Chapter 3. Upon landing on the massive forge of Eldia, the Celestial Sons were assaulted by both the Imperial Guard and the Skitari, who had fallen to Nurgle's rot. The sudden shock of having both Imperial weaponry and Skitari technology being used on the Sons led to many casualties. However, the Celestial Suns quickly recovered, and they began their offensive. Once again, the Suns were shocked when Guardsmen were able to brush aside deadly wounds, and some would even ignore the loss of a limb. This unnatural resilience caught the eye of the captain of the Cataphracti Terminator squads, Bellacrax. Bellacrax was always fighting in the front lines, and as such, he was a veteran warrior who was always covered in scars. He was prideful, and he thought himself the toughest marine within the ranks of the Celestial Sons. But when he saw how the infected Skitari ignored these mortal blows, Bellacrax wanted this power. This obsession of his drove him towards unthinkable acts such as the consumption of their rotting flesh and the murder of his own battle brothers in order to keep his actions hidden. With the weapons of the forge being used against the space marines, the corrupted forces of Nurgle claimed many more lives. It was all thanks to the valiant efforts of Vicus Rowan and his sacrifice that the space marines were able to breach the forge. Donning double storm shields, Rowan charged straight through a barrage of fire until he managed to bypass the plague-ridden barricades. Mere moments later, massive explosions began ringing out from the dual plasma eradicator gun emplacements. As the Celestial Suns charged forth into the forge, Apothecary Zakos found the charred remains of Rowan. As he attempted to extract his gene seed, he noticed that the Iron Sun still lived. With his entire right side missing, 
Rowan's only hope to continue the fight was to be interred within the sarcophagus of the mighty Dreadnought. The few remaining Adeptus Mechanicus forces sent distress signals directly to Terra. They sent word of the despicable actions being committed by the 11th Legion, the massacre of Eldius Populus, the corruption in alliance with an unknown demonic entity, and plans to assassinate the Emperor. Alec Elric personally entered the command room of the forge, and he burned the last remaining Skitari traitors to ash and molten slag. While trying to uncover the cause of the demonic incursion, Elric came across an encrypted message speaking about a secret dragon cult, an organization within the Adeptus Mechanicus that praised a star god by the name of the Void Dragon. This being was being praised as the Omnissiah, and it was secretly being kept beneath the red sands of Mars. But the most heretical thing of all were battle plans to assault Holy Terra by wielding the might of this dragon. The Star God would drain the machine spirit from all Imperial technology, rendering it useless, while empowering the Mechanicus's technology. Elric knew that if this were to happen, Terra and the entire Imperium would surely fall. The Primarch quickly sent word to the Emperor of his findings, but the Emperor had already received the false messages of the Skatari. Primarch Alec Elric and the entirety of the 11th Legion, the Celestial Sons, had been labeled as traitors, and with a heavy heart, the Emperor gave the order to his forces. The Edict of Obliteration had just been enacted. The Celestial Suns began cleansing campaigns all across the world and moon of Aldia, while they awaited a response from the Emperor. But nothing was ever received. Weeks went by, and finally a sign. From the heavens, multiple battle barges of the 11th Legion came crashing down. The skies were blotted out from the numerous warships of the Space Wolves, Sisters of Silence, and Adeptus Custodes. On this day, the Celestial Sun would be forever eclipsed. Celestial Sun Lore Chapter 5 The Fractured Sun Incident We were greeted with death. The Emperor had enacted the Edict of Obliteration upon the 11th Legion. For the first time ever, the Imperium sent out its execution force to silence and bury one of their own, the Celestial Sons. The combined armada of the Space Wolves, Sisters of Silence, and the Adeptus Custodes was large enough to blot out the light of the Sun. The Emperor had planned out his execution force specifically to annihilate the Celestial Suns. The main force was that of the Space Wolves, for their hatred of psychic users would fuel their bloodlust. A supplemental force of Sisters of Silence would be needed to nullify the Astartes' warp capabilities, and the final nail on the coffin is the single five-man unit, the Emperor's right hand the Legio Custodes. The attack took the Celestial Suns completely by surprise. The Primarch, Alec Elric, attempted to comprehend exactly what was going on. He sent word of his findings of the Mechanicus's plans of a coup via the Dragon Cult. Why strike at one of their own, he thought. Was the Emperor working alongside the Cult? He couldn't, for the Void Dragon would cripple humanity via the machine spirit. And then it hit him. This had to be the nefarious doings of the demons of plague and rot. He had walked right into their trap. Yet again, Elric had been played by Zeech's plots. But Elric had no time to curse at his puppet masters, for the sky began to rain, the wreckage of his fleet. The naval battle above the forge world of Aldia was swift 
and bloody efficient. Battle barge after battle barge came plummeting down, each fiery explosion shaking the world. Vox communication was ignored by the execution force, and upon seeing hundreds of his battle brothers fall against the orbital strike, Elric ordered any surviving celestial suns to make planet fall, and to make their last stand one worthy of legend. Fierce battles began being waged all across the forge. Perhaps fierce doesn't quite fit, for the ferocity of the space wolves was unmatched. They tore into their traitorous battle brothers with no remorse, no hesitation. The wolves had located their prey, and they were out to kill. One looking from the outside would never have thought that the eleventh and the sixth had once fought side by side. There were countless casualties and tons of wounded on the Celestial Sun side, so much so that battle brother Arunsar had to erect a makeshift infirmary. He tended to the wounded, but the wolves were quickly upon him. Bolter rounds tore through one of the wounded. Channeling his inner fire, Arunsar summoned forth spears of condensed flame. Fenrisian power armor stood no chance against this psychic attack and the squad fell as they burned alive from the inside out. But from behind their smoldering carcasses, another five-man squad of space wolves charged forth, chain swords revving. Arunsar grabbed his combat knife, for he didn't have chance to use the flame spears once again. Bang! 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 Bolter fire rang out from behind Arunsar, and as he turned to see who could have shot, it was none other than the wounded Celestial Sons. Their bolt pistols was just enough to take down the charging five-man squad. But a warrior clad in golden armor appeared. Arunsar instantly knew who this was, and he yelled at his men to retreat. But in the blink of an eye, he was already upon the wounded Astartes. His movements appeared like a blur, but each attack was a perfect killing blow. Before the dead could even fall to the ground, he had already set his sights on Arunsar. The Celestial Sun braced himself for the ensuing flurry of blows, but none came. Traitor Astarte of the Eleventh Legion, the Emperor of Mankind has ordered for your destruction. However, now is your only chance for redemption. Lend your aid to the Imperium, and help us end this bloodshed. Strike down your corrupted battle brothers, and our Emperor will welcome you back to Imperial Fold. The Custody then picks up one of the bolt guns from one of the dead marines, and hands it to Arunsar. The Celestial Sun turns around and sees the wounded battle brothers from within his infirmary. The wounded marines then point their bolt pistols at him. You know what must be done, the custody remarks before leaving the scene. The air is tense as the battle brothers of the 11th stare each other down, trigger fingers at the ready. Bang, bang, bang. Bloody footprints lead away from the burning infirmary. What? have I done. They had fought side by side with me for decades, and yet I butchered them. But they deserved it. They pointed their bolters at me, the one who tended to their wounds, the one who protected them, <coughs> the one who has been blessed by the sun, the one who wields the powers of the warp. The one who will burn everything to cinders. Arunsar falls to the ground, blood pouring out from the bolter wounds all across his body. <laughs> I've ignored your voice for so long now, but you've won this time. I accept your offer. Arunsar raises his hand up to the sky. 
flames begin to engulf the Astarte. Fire, as hot as the sun itself, scorches his flesh away, but also cauterizes his wounds. Arunsar rises, but no longer is he under the light of the celestial sun. His allegiance now lies with the abyss we call chaos. Celestial Sun Lore, Chapter 5 The Fractured Sun Incident, Part 2 Atop the Adeptus Mechanicus Observatory, Elric takes in the death and destruction all around him. He sighs as he notices a presence behind him. Why, brother? We fought side by side. You should know this doesn't have to happen. Forces unbeknownst to us are orchestrating our own demise. We must inform the Emperor. Lehman Russ cuts off Elric with a snarl, and he takes out his weapon. Elric puts on his helmet as well, and also readies his spear. The Primarchs of the Sixth and the Eleventh Legions begin their fated battle amidst the cries of a dying world. A whirlwind of fury dances across the battleground as sparks and blood splatter, both warriors unrelenting in their assault. The icy fist of the Wolf King connects hard across Elric's head, cracking his helmet. The next two blows launches him across the observatory before a tackle sends them both plummeting through a window to the ground below. As Elric crashes through the glass, Time seems to slow down. He sees his reflection in the glass all around him. His armor has been torn to shreds. How has he taken so much damage? Was he subconsciously losing on purpose? Did he want to die along with his legion on this world? The dust settles and Russ stands above Elric, spear at his throat. I expected more from you, so-called Light of the Imperium. And with that, the wolf's fangs pierces his prey's neck. The execution has been enacted. Or so he thought. Just then, Elric's body begins to burn with a white-hot flame. The wound in his throat cauterized, he stands once again. The heat radiating from Elric scorches Russ's body. It feels as though the sun itself is right before him. He has to end this quick, before he's burned to a crisp. His vision is already blurring as the liquid in his eyes begins to evaporate. Damned witch! Russ yells out as blood flies out from his dried throat. Fire and ice clash once again. But this time, the Wolf King's spear rips its way through Elric's chest, narrowly missing his heart. The fire fades, and the Primarch of the Celestial Suns coughs up blood. A smirk forms on his face, for he strategically took the hit in order to ensure his next attack would be a death blow. With all his might, Elric thrusts his spear at his opponent. But upon impact, the spear tip shatters. Emerald light glimmers for a split second as a massive shockwave sends both Primarchs flying across the world. Emerging from its ancient prison, a being from a long distant past has been set free. This is a Katan of Zvakotar, the Void Eater. Created from swirling gases and a tremendous amount of energy this is an ancient star god who has existed since the origins of the universe. At first, these gods ate upon the very stars themselves, uncaring of everything around them, until the Necrontier made contact with them. With an earth-shaking roar, the Shard of Zvakotar made his presence known to all those on the Forge of Eldia. The entirety of the Space Wolf Legion instinctively knew the danger that this being possessed. Even before its body could fully manifest, 
its blood-red eyes locked on to a squad of space wolves. Their bolters had little to no effect as the Catan devoured the five-man squad in a single gulp, erasing them from existence along with the rubble they stood upon. Ross could barely contain his anger as he assumed that this creature was created via psychic powers, further cementing his hatred for psychers. Seeing that the creature kept increasing in size and power, Russ had no choice but to vox for all available Imperial forces to convene on his location and eradicate this new threat. This was the break the Celestial Sons needed. Although many had either perished or sided with the Imperium, those who still pled loyally to the Primarch of the Eleventh had very little to no way of leaving the planet. With their Vox communications being jammed, all hope seemed lost. But their fire never gave out. They continued to fight for their Primarch's sake. Until he gave the order, they would give it their all. Alec Elric awoke impaled on a piece of rebar. The force of the Catan's release sent him through piles of rubble. Battered, bloody, and broken, Elric saw the cataclysmic battle against this creature, which resided within his weapon. Was this yet another one of Zeech's plots? He had no time to ponder this question. Elric had to act fast. He saw a crashed Thunderhawk over the horizon, and betting it would still operate, he began making his way over towards it. But out from the corner of his eye, two golden beams struck down. From golden light they came, two of the Imperium's finest warriors, the Adeptus Custodes, had come for Elric. The Emperor's finest fought as one, each other covering any openings while the other attacked. Elric had to use his secondary weapon, a broadsword which he would wreathe in warp flame. This bulky weapon, in Elric's worn out state, allowed for the battle to come to a standstill. However, Elric knew that the longer this fight lasted, the likelihood of him coming out victorious went down. Still, he pressed on the attack, and when the Custody went to parry, the multiple warp flame hits finally weakened the Castellan axe enough to cleave through its hilt and straight through the warrior's chest. The agonizing heat cooked the Custody from the inside out, but yet he grabbed on to Elric's sword. The other custody utilized this sacrifice to get behind Elric. Donning his own and his fallen comrade's Mesocordia, he let out a barrage of slicing attacks. Just then, a hail of Volkite blasts ripped apart the Adeptus custody. Tachyon Black and the Angelus Solaris had arrived. With the aid of his honor guard, Elric made his way into the Thunderhawk gunship, and to their surprise, it worked, but all was not well. Succumbing to his wounds, Elric began to fall in and out of consciousness. Visions of death, destruction, and so much more plagued the Primarch once again, plummeting his psyche into despair. Elric awoke in a black abyss. Before him stood a massive entity, donning a white mask. Finally. We meet face to face, Primar. The Eleventh Legion was charged with treason, the use of forbidden Xeno technology, falsely accusing the Adeptus Mechanicus of treason, planetary genocide, and suspicion of utilizing forbidden warp powers. Some Celestial Son Astartes turned their back on their legion and they were inducted into the ranks of the Ultramarines. The Forge of Eldia was met with Exterminatus, eliminating the Catanshar and any stranded Celestial Sun. Alec Elric and those still loyal to him fled into space, unorganized and with Imperial Strike Forces searching for them. The Celestial Suns and their Primarch were erased from all Imperial records. The Age of Light had come 
to its end. Oh,